Hello, hello, friends. Wonderful to be back here with all of you. We're coming together for another Sama Saturday. And um, we are here with Dr. Barry Sands today. Hello, Dr. Sands. Hi, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. It's been it's a pleasure to be here today on this beautiful Saturday morning. Yes, and we really love being able to have these times with all of you to share, to impart wisdom, to inspire, to, you know, help you to understand whatever our topic is, and then to be able to also answer your questions and, and talk amongst ourselves, right, to be able to help one another, share resources, share feedback, so that we really create a space for our Sama Dog community. That's what Sama Saturdays are all about, is bringing in that holistic perspective into every area of our canines body, mind, and spirit, and their overall health. So today, our conversation, let me bring it up here, is behavioral tips, five, or behavioral health, rather, five top tips for canine wellness. And, um, you know, when, the reason we came to this conversation specifically is because, especially over the last couple of years, you know, mental health has become critically important for all of our lives. We have, many of us have faced these challenges within our families. We certainly have in my family and surely many of you can relate to that as well. And the good news is, is that there's more and more focus and conversation and resources on be, that are coming out that are able to help us and provide the support that we need to get through these challenges. However, there are a few members of our family that are also being affected by these difficult times and perhaps are really struggling too, but they don't have a voice to be able to express that. So that's why we wanted to have this conversation today with Dr. Sands to help bring attention, understanding, and potential solutions to the mental health or behavioral challenges that you might be having with your dog, especially in these past couple of years. So just like humans, it's especially an important aspect of our lives, mental health, and it contributes to our wellness and our longevity in so many ways. So as a seasoned vet who has a deep passion for natural healing and the connection between humans and their pets, Dr. Sands will provide us top uh, her five top tips for supporting our pets who might be struggling uh, sometimes even more than we realize. And we'll get into that today. So as with all of our Sama Saturdays, we will uh, share with you knowledge and wisdom and inspiration and resources. And we also, as I mentioned, will have time for your questions. So that's just a little opening to our conversation, context to where we're heading today. And I want to introduce Dr. Barry Sands a little bit more formally. And for anyone coming on with us, please let us know you're here. Who are you watching with? Where are you watching from? And go ahead and, you know, at any time, share your questions or any of the circumstances that are going on with your animals, because then we can kind of weave that into our discussion today. Dr. Barry Sands is an emer uh, emergency and an integrative functional medicine veterinarian at VCA Emergency Hospital and Referral Center in San Diego. She is also the founder of Illumina Ciencia, and uh, her awesome organization and contribution to this world that's so unique and beautiful. We'll talk more about it. She blends the best of allopathic and holistic practices to support animal wellness and has been a veterinarian for over 30 years, emergency and critical care for 25 years, and holistic for 17. She has an extensive background with HeartMath, which you might be familiar with, the HeartMath Institute, um, where using brain waves and heart coherence and biofeedback to heal the body in the mind. Wonderful science. More from Dr. Sands can be found at drberrysands.com. And there's tons of resources there. She has awesome articles. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about a survey that she has on there that pertains specifically to what we're talking about today. So I will go ahead and just kind of turn it over to Dr. Sands for some opening, just kind of kick us off, and then we'll get into the five tips. Yeah, so I'm so happy and blessed and honored to be invited to speak to everyone today on this really, really impactful, important topic of, of mental wellness. We have been inundated with so much stress of our own mental health that affects our emotional well-being, our physical well-being, and that I feel like that's very um it's very uh, obvious for humans um, and uh, humans that are living with dogs and also cats or other animals have also um, experienced maybe a heightened change in the mental um, and physical status of their pets that they live with because of everything we're going through these last two years 
which makes this conversation even more um, impactful and important um, in this time and age that we, as we move through this into a new type of paradigm so that we can really be, know how to navigate, what to do, what tools can we use so that we can help our animals and ourselves as we move through this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, hello. <laughs> little fur friend. Wanted to get a little closer to this conversation. Benny, you want to say hello to everyone? Oh, hello, Benny. Hello, hello. Oh, looking all, looking all scared. He just wants to relax. He's like, I didn't really, I wasn't ready to come on camera. <laughs> My face isn't washed yet. <laughs> <I'm> brushed. <laughs> So uh, let's go ahead and get into our topics. It's so important that you kind of laid out foundation, Dr. Sands, and tie it into, you know, why we're having this conversation and why it's so important right now today. Um, I think there's a lot that isn't known or isn't even thought about in the lives of our companion animals. And that's why we really kind of wanted to help open some minds and kind of bring some aha moments into this these conversations. So our first topic is the animal human relations, something that Dr. Sands is definitely an expert and so passionate about. We spend a lot of our time, even as friends, just talking about this. So, so yeah, what are your thoughts when it comes to mental health? Yeah, well, it's a very, very broad topic, but there's no, um, there's uh, no non, there's no non-understanding, or I say there's a, there's a full understanding that humans and animals and the animals that we live with share our emotions and um, and the frequencies that we emit with each other. And these human animal bonds have always been expressed um, as these wonderful positive relationships that we have with each other. Whereas, you know, you hold your dog and you, it, you the, the connection, the petting, the um, even cats, the, the purring of cats, the sounds that they make helps us relax, helps us helps us decrease our blood pressure, helps us relieve our anxiety. You know, these pet therapy animals um, are very paramount to the human psyche. Um, but the, there, it also works on the other side, that our level of emotional integrity and how we navigate through our emotional landscape really has an impact on the animals that we're sharing our space with, you know, especially those animals that are invested in us, particularly. Because um, everyone knows if you, you know, if you, you live in a family and maybe you have one dog, two dogs, or maybe even more, there's always an animal or a dog that bonds more to a human. You know, this is my dog, this one's her dog. And, and so we, what I'm finding especially in my, um, in my career, in my uh, relationships with my clients, and also in the survey that I have put out is that um, our, our, the energetics of our human animal bonds in, and our emotional ties between each other are a lot more relevant than, than we have imagined or what we thought could be because we're, sh we're finding that there is a physiological component that creates almost like a biological shift or an upgrade that is shared between the human and the animal. And, you know, I say that Amanda uh, is because, it, you know, if you go into any veterinarian um, facility or a conference where there's tons of vets and you ask them, hey, have you ever noticed that your um, clients have the same disease as the patients that you're treating? Every single one of them on some level will say, yes, of course, I see that all the time. And, you know, over the years, I have just, you know, taken a step back and saying, well, wow, that is an, such an interesting phenomenon that we seem to be just, mm, you know, blowing off as just a thing, but it's um, extremely impactful and important. So that's what led me down to this research of understanding the really the value between the energetic frequencies and bonds between our human animal relationships, you know, and how we can alter that, how we can help each other, you know, grow and heal with different types of modalities and, and, uh, and, and just emotional frequencies that we, that we share between the two of them. 
Mm -hmm. There's so much potential there for both of us. And maybe even that's why these animals have come into our lives. You know, it's not just to be a companion and to be loving. And those are all beautiful aspects of our relationship, but they can be our teachers and our guides and especially through turbulent times. And we can awaken and learn and a lot about ourselves and the world together. And, um, and, you know, that's why it's been so important, the work that you've been doing, Dr. Sands, with understanding that relationship and getting some data on it. So why don't we right now just share a little bit about your survey? I'll put the link in the comments right now so people know that they can go to it, but t share with them what is that survey for? Yeah, so the survey is really a meta-analysis data collection base for me to just hear from the world of from from the human themselves with the relation they have with their pets um you know have you ever um in now or in the past uh shared a disease process with your pet that's kind of you know the first question it's the energetic bonds between human and animal relationships and it doesn't matter what species you have if you have horses or birds or ferrets or you know, dogs and cats, it doesn't matter. I, I feel like the predominant um, species that seems to come up so far in these surveys are, are dogs, uh, because dogs are really these sentient beings of service. And they come into our lives, as Amanda, you were saying, for a reason, you know, and think back, you know, what we, you know, we're talking about mental wellness and behavior. Well, you know, think back as to when you got this animal in your life. Where did this dog show up? How did it show up? You know, was it a rescue? Did you seek it out? Did it find you? Mm -hmm. You know, really go back and, and see how that entered your life. Because I feel like that's a significant meeting point for the both of you, you know, at, in, in a healing phase. You, you know, it, it reminds you of a one story that I had. I have this um, in clinics, super fun story. There was this um, big man that showed up like, muscular, maybe 230 pounds, all, you know, tall and big. And he comes in with this tiny little Yorkie. <laughs> and this little Yorkie, her name was what? Like question mark. And I had to, I had to know, I had to know what, how, how this dog got her name. And um, so I asked him, I says, tell me about the, your dog's name. How did, how did you find each other and how'd you name her? He said, well, look, I was, I was in, I, I didn't have any dogs in my life and I was looking for a dog to be a part of my existence and to share it with. So I, I didn't, I wanted to go to, the, to a pound. I didn't want to, you know, purchase one. So I just went to a place that had all these dogs. And I stood in the middle of this arena and I figured that the dog that came up to me first was going to be the one for me. And he just stood there. And then within a, I don't know, a few moments, he looks down at his feet because he feels a dog at his foot. And he looks down and he sees this tiny little Yorkie. <laughs> and, he, and, the, and he looks down at her and he says, what? <laughs> like, that's the dog that shows up for me. Like, here he is thinking he's going to get a pit bull or a Labrador or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and so perhaps this this little beautiful Yorkie that was so sweet and so small, you know, and was a female was really his counterpart, energetic counterpart. You know, he was this big, strong man, and here is this small little female. You know, to really allow him to get in touch with maybe his sacred feminine side. I don't know, but yeah. you know, I think that there's reasons for why we find the animals we find and how they enter our lives. Yeah. Yeah, I know for me, myself and my work that I do through Sama Dog, every dog that has come into our lives and any duration really has taught me so much. And more often than not, I will go on this big exploration of learning and research and I'll, you know, get all into a topic and helping my own dog. And then within two weeks, three weeks, I'll have a client call that has the exact same condition with their dog. And it's like, well, actually, I just have a whole dissertation written up on this. And so it's, it just is lined up, you know, and the universe works through us in mysterious ways. And our animals are awesome conduits of that. So whether it's in just our own relationship, if it's for them, it's for us, it's for someone in our family, it's for someone that we work with or know, there are a lot of reasons why things are happening the way they are. And 
it's our opportunity to be able to step into that and say, yes, I'm willing, I'm open, I want to learn, I want to help, teach me, show me. And that's why we have these conversations because there's a lot of wisdom out there and we just need to gather it and draw it in to be able to apply it in our own life. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when we talk about mental wellness and behavior issues, you know, there's the challenge lies in the knowing that the behavior is a, a, a result of, an, of a very, a lot of other things that are kind of underlying the layers of that expression mm-hmm. of that biology in that animal. You know, it, it the backlogs of how you come up with a behavior comes from, you know, first, perhaps, you know, a thought, you have a thought, which allows you to have a feeling and the feeling or emotion creates you to have an action. And then that action creates an experience and that experience creates the behavior. Mm. So it just kind of all circles around and through. And so it's not, it's, it's tough and challenging to deal with behavioral problems, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. You just have to understand the mechanisms that got you there Mm. to help kind of peel those layers down and really, really address all of those really important points along the way that got you there in the first place. And and that's true for humans. And that's true for our animals, you know, that share our our space with us. Mm -hmm. So I think some of these points that we're going to hit upon are really going to kind of dive into, you know, a little bit of exploring those layers Mm -hmm. that we can get a better understanding of, you know, what am I going to do with my, with my, my anxious dog, my crazy yeah. dog, my, you know, that kind of thing. well, that's exactly the question that Susan wrote in. And I'm sure so many people have it. Her question, I'll just pop it up here is that she's been home since COVID and my pup is used to being by my side 24 seven. What's the best way to help him? I've been working on his anxiety and now he has separation anxiety. I hear that from so many people. I've even experienced it with my own dog, Violet, who, you know, was pretty secure in herself, but I think just us all being home so much has really made a difference. Now, when I notice when we come home, she's like squealing and jumping at the door and there's just like an intensity and a fear behind her behaviors that never was there before. So, I say that I share that now so that we can kind of weave that in because there's so many um, in each of the points we're going to make, there's pertinent information that can apply to a dog with separation anxiety. So if there's anything you want to comment on that now, and then at the end, we'll come back to that question again. Yeah. Well, remember, you know, that, that dog before COVID, you know, pre COVID policies, at least, at least what I'm hearing in this, in this question didn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. You know, and so here you have a a dog who understands the relationships and the dynamics. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're you're home, right? Because we spend a lot of time being home. Mm -hmm. And that was a a transition for animals from, you know, hanging out without you to all of a sudden having to be with you. And that created a lot of stress Mm -hmm. for these animals being in the same situation. I mean, we've we saw massive amounts of physiological manifestations of stress in my clinic, you know, usually GI related, you know, anorexia, not eating, diarrhea, vomiting, um, uh, you know, stress related seizures, heart issues, you know, on and on because they were now in such close proximity to us where we're so stressed, right? Mm -hmm. And so then they had to sort of figure out their relationship, you know, this new relationship now that they're having and so perhaps a lot of them have sort of found their new norm in in the state that we were in. And now we're all going back to work and now we're getting back to our lives. But now they need to re-equilibrate those, yeah. that situation because they don't understand it anymore. You know, they, so I, I, there's definitely ways, you know, to have them sort of remember um, and reintegrate you know, how they were prior, you yeah. know, to, to us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say, pardon me, if everyone hears snoring on that end, it is this little pug that's under my desk and I wanted to mute myself, but then I want to be able to engage. So pardon the snores. Yeah. 
Moving on to our next tip, which is the consideration of natural instincts and tendencies. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, call, I like to call this um, doghood, you know, doghoodness, you know, and embracing what these dogs are meant to do in nature and how as humans we are counter being counterproductive, you know, with, with their innate um, desires to be who they are. Um, and we, you know, I see this in my, in, even in my own home, in my own experiences where an animal, well, for one, our emotional um, uh, anthropomorphizing, mm -hmm. you know, into what we feel the animal is feeling, even though the animal's not feeling it. You know, they may have, um, they may be walking around and being anxious because they have to go to the bathroom and we're not really tuning into that and, or they want something from us. And now we're saying, oh, you know, the dog is, is uh, you know, he's having a panic attack or he's being, he's upset with me. Or, you know, my daughter was saying, oh, my, you know, he's being so judgmental. <laughs> I'm like, I don't think he's being judgmental. <laughs> you know, he's like, yeah, look, he's judging me as I'm doing this. He's judging me. And I'm like, mm, you know, maybe not. You know, I don't really feel that that's a, a, an attribute of some of these dogs. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's curious. You know, maybe he's maybe he's feeling like he wants to be in, involved, you know. And so we just keep putting our emotions into them. And they're going to pick up on that on some level, whether it's which it's real or it's not real. It's going to manifest in some way. Um, but you know, aside from all of that, um, you know, Amanda and I were talking about uh, we, you know, allowing our dogs to be dogs. You know, they are, yes, they're part of our families. We call them fur babies. You know, some of us have the animals that are because we don't have children. You know, but regardless, they're still dogs, and they like to do dog things. You know, dogs like to get in nature. They like to, you know, get in, in, in gross stuff. They like to roll in the dirt. They like to roll in cow patties and horse poop. Mm -hmm. You know, they like to, um, it's important, very important for dogs to go out on a walk and, you know, twice a day, at least, mm -hmm. you know, at the beginning of the day. Um, and then maybe at the end of the day, and if they can in the middle, if they want, why not, you know, but to, um, the physiologic importance of going out in the um, in the mornings is because because of their circadian rhythms, mm -hmm. their bodies and their hormones that are getting secreted are very in tune to the light as it comes into their retinas. And so just like us, mm -hmm. you know, when the sun comes up and we sense the light behind our eyelids, immediately, you know, these cells in the back of our of our eyes, these they called melanoopsins that take in the light and now are telling our brain it's time to wake up. Mm -hmm. And so things like serotonin are starting to be released. You know, the alert, the sort of get me going, get me awake kind of hormones. Um, and then there's a flood of stuff that starts coming into our body. So say, okay, let's start the day. And then we go about doing that. And, and same thing at night when the light starts to go down and we start to see that shift in the brighten and, uh, the shift towards the darkness, we will start um, secreting melatonin. And mm -hmm. melatonin is the sleepy hormone that sort of puts you to bed. You know, mm -hmm. Sarah wakes you up and Mel puts you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> so that's that's super important, you know, to kind of get the dog feeling it's in it's engaged in the world. They mm -hmm. want to be engaged in nature. Yeah. yeah. And the way that they also do that is through their smelling and their sense of smell. You know, we call it going on a snafari. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that term. I didn't make it up, but I thought of it. And then I saw that everybody was thinking about it. <laughs> so it's like this global, you know, word that we've all thought about. And the, what we found is that the more dogs get out there and they smell, it gives them a sense of connection, grounding. It relaxes them. It has decreased anxieties and depression in dogs. Mm -hmm. And also in alignment with that, um, you know, it's important to allow a dog choices. Let him make his choices. When he goes out on a walk, let it be his journey or her journey where 
let them choose which direction they want to go in. Mm -hmm. you know, like sometimes, you know, we're very in our own lives. It's like, oh, I got to go walk the dog. You know, I got to do it really quick. Let me come on. Come on. Let's go. We're going to go. We're going to go up and down the street really fast. You do your business. I'm going to go inside and I got to go to work. Right. And that and the dog's like, wait a minute. That was my opportunity. Yeah. And I and I just missed it. What? I wanted to go left. You wanted to go right. There's a smell over there that I need to embrace. And and I didn't get a chance to do that. You know, and, and I think that that saddens them as well, that they don't really have that opportunity to investigate the outside world like they want to. Mm -hmm. You know, the, so, I mean, yep. that's, you know, certainly my experience in my own dog mm -hmm. um, and the dogs in our neighborhood, um, you know, for like just to share uh, our dog, Barley, is a mixed breed dog um, and we've trained him early on from his, from being a puppy to not be on a leash and he walks next to us uh and he's free to go in front of us if he if he likes um and what we've what we found at first it was like this fear like okay like well, what is he going to do when a dog shows up is he going to run across the street is he going to engage is there going to be a problem is he going to run away from us but you know in the process of of behavior of training him to like okay this is what we're going to do and this is your commands to sit or come or stay he i find that he listens so well it, it's um it's uncanny how he's just so happy being on a walk and he's so well behaved where mm -hmm. um, other dogs will come and go and they're on leashes and they're barking and they're unruly and they're pulling and he just stands there and looks at him, wags his tail, mm -hmm. waves across the street. <laughs> you know, I so said, let me next time we'll say hi or or, or something. But there, he's just so chill. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I, I feel like that a lot of that is because he's allowed to, to, to be a dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's yeah. fulfilled, you know, just like us mm -hmm. when we have that fulfillment on that the many layers of our being, we, oh, we behave better. We show up nicer. We're more present. We're less aggressive. We're less hasty. You know, think of our better self driving down the street in a car and being very passive when someone comes flying up, right. And cuts us off. And it's like, Oh, okay, go right ahead. You obviously are in a hurry. You kind of make a joke of it versus when we're not in that balanced place and we're angry and getting up on the person and, you know, and it's, it's just like a very different space in, inside of ourselves that then presents itself outside in the, in the world. And you really see that in our dogs because they can't converse with us and tell us what's going on with themselves. When we see these negative behaviors, oftentimes if they could speak English to us, they would say, I'm really unhappy. My needs are not being met. I feel blankety blank. And then, you know, we would be able to help them. But now we have to be a little bit like detectives and figuring out what it is that our animals ultimately need, what it, it is that that specific animal in front of you, your own, is needing and be able to create in the best way we can that circumstance. Some people in cities, you know, they're not able to maybe let the dog off a leash if they're in a very busy city, but they certainly could give their dog a little bit of a longer leash, perhaps go into the park and just let them sniff. If right. they want to hang out there for five minutes on one little bush and sniff it, then then you just, you know, take some right. breath and enjoy yourself, enjoy your time outside as well. And we don't realize how much that's doing for that dog th to not hurry it along and give it that deeply fulfilling experience that they can have. Right. Right. I mean, they say there's that saying one person's trash is another person's treasure, <laughs> you know? And you know, when your dog is, is walking by and he sees this mound of, you know, God knows what it is. It could be decaying animal and it's gross to you. And, but their nose is in there and they're just, spending a lot of time mm -hmm. invested in this clump of stuff and you know that's not that's not the time to say oh that's so disgusting let's go you mm -hmm. know let him sniff it i mean I, I, yeah if he's going to be chowing down on it maybe yeah. not <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah, but you know let let him let him let them yeah the curiosity being met and just remembering how how much of our dog's time is spent indoors in on a carpeted floor tile or you know hardwood and again removed from nature 
And when you look at them and you look at wolves, yes, the little pug might not be so much like that, but, you know, look the same, but inside and in their desires and their instincts, their um, natural, you know, um, tendencies are still very much the same. And you imagine a wolf inside all day long, you know, this thing's going to be miserable. And so um, just remembering to take them back into that natural state as often as possible can be like giving them a medicine, in fact. Right. Right. And then, you know, and there are plenty of studies that have that are out in, in animal behavior magazines um, and journals that are that are saying just that, you know, they're saying go out and 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 be in the environment and roll in the grass and ground yourself. You know, there's another aspect of being out in nature, barefoot in the soil, connecting that allows the body to do what's called an earthing or grounding you know, where you have these negative ions that are coming up from the surface of the, of the planet that are now infusing our bodies to balance out the energies. And, you know, these native indigenous cultures have been doing this for forever. And, you know, you don't need a study, um, a double-blinded placebo-controlled study to know that nature is, is healthy for you and exercise is good. Yeah. You know, and that's, and that's another thing too, is exercise, you know, burning off that energy. Mm -hmm. you know, if you have this nervous energy inside the house, it's energy is still energy and it needs to go somewhere. And so mm -hmm. if you go for a run or go for a hike, you're, you're, you're eliminating and, and transmuting that energy that you have inside in a physical way. And then you feel much more relaxed, you know, and we don't need a study to show that exercise and getting outside in the sunshine for 15 minutes a day um, is, is healthier for you. Mm -hmm. you know, we we know that to be true. I think people just like to have studies because it, I don't know, it validates the need to go, yeah. out, you know. Yeah, to, to to say it. It. the same is for our animals with exercise, right? right. So, and so oftentimes we do have them on the leash. We go out for a relatively short walk around the block and then back into the house and they weren't even able to stretch their legs. They weren't ever able to run through that experience, you know, and just exhaust themselves. So you can kind of imagine that they're sort of just like cooped up, right? It's like, ah, yeah. and yet they're so accepting that it's like, all right, I'll chill out on the couch for eight more hours. And then that accumulates though. And so that's what you mean at the beginning by this kind of unraveling or unpeeling, like look at how you've gotten to where you are and slowly start to unpeel the layers that will bring you back to that natural place and back to that happy dog again. So. Right. Right. And, our, and, 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 and I think in a lot of households, I know in mine, um, you know, at the end of the day, it, there's, he gets these zoomies, you know, mm -hmm. the little zoomies, where they just, he's just out of his mind and, and the cats too, they'll just go through this process of burning this energy, you know, mm -hmm. that they have so that because they, they're, they know that we're all going to go to sleep and they're expected to go to sleep. And so they have to burn this off. So if we start thinking about, you know, behaviors and emotions um, as, as just energy frequencies, it's easier to transmute that from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. All right. So moving on to our next one, which is a big topic, but we'll just touch on it. Um, I also will actually provide um, some additional resource here in gut health, you know, the yeah. microbiome and the state of digestion and how that lends itself to behavior. Now that specifically is something that not a lot of people are, are so familiar with. So Dr. Sand, share with us more on that. Yeah, well, you know, in the last probably 10 years or even, even less, um, the, the value of the gut microbiome and its relationship to our entire physiology, our immune system, our mental health, um, our, our entire regulatory mechanisms has been um, revealing itself as this is this paramount place of of um, importance that we really really need to understand and embrace mm -hmm. and i have to say that in in animals um dogs and cats mm -hmm. um, that live with us we we kind of basically have spent a lot of time uh not only not supporting the microbiome of the gut, but actually destroying the microbiome of the gut. And you know, we say food, food is the food is the problem, but it's also the solution. And it's the types of food. And I know that you've have you have many 
um, uh, other episodes that talk about, you know, gut health and the right foods. And I'm sure the people watching this are very aware of the importance of healthy diets. Um, but the diversity of the, the gut microbiome is what keeps us really in tune and in check and in connection with nature and the natural world around us. Um, we know that 90% of the serotonin that gets um, uh, secreted in our bodies comes from our gut. And 50% of the dopamine comes from our gut. Mm. And that is a tremendous amount of, of serotonin. And, and it will not get released if there is a imbalance of the microbiome, if there are inflammation in the gut, if the, um, the junctions of the enterocytes are, are loose, we call that leaky gut. Um, if, uh, if there is a, a poor population of, of bacteria, um, you know, that we're, we're not going to get those secretions of, of serotonin and serotonin is, is the, the hormone, the neurotransmitter that creates that level of calm and balance. And I mean, we look at all the pharmaceuticals out there are they're, they're called SSRI um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, right? All these pharmaceutical drugs that are coming out for anti-depression and anxiety are, are, there, are there to balance out the levels of serotonin in your brain. Mm -hmm. So as we give these serotonin reuptake inhibitors, what that means is that it's creating more serotonin in the synaptic channels to be accumulated so that you have more of it. Mm -hmm. And so honestly, I was, you know, you could just enhance the microbiome of the gut, focus on that to create your natural serotonin process instead of taking a drug that's going to take what you already have, but accumulate it more in the spaces that it's needed. You know, it's just such, it seems like such a simple solution to just create the environment inside of your own body that's going to make it. You know, and, and that's where the functional medicine comes into play is really just giving the body the nutrients and the sources that it needs to create all of these things, because our bodies are our greatest pharmacy you've ever met. You know? and, and we have the ability to, to make everything we need, mm -hmm. you know, and so um, focusing on the, uh, the gut microbiome um, to enable that to create those hormones of behavior is really about just putting in, in those really, really healthy, fresh, um, bioavailable food sources to create a microbiome that is, is just diverse. Mm -hmm. and beautiful. You know, and there's lots of, you know, we could talk about specifics and resources. You know, mm -hmm. that's the, the gist and the understanding of the importance, you know, of that. Um, there's, like you said, we could talk, do a whole... Yeah. hour on talking about the microbiome. Yeah, there's so many ways to promote it and to help it along. I have put in a link here, if anyone's interested, um, a conversation that we had with Dr. Kangas and Dr. Holly Dans, who's a microbiome specialist for animals. So it's very interesting. And that, but you'll find also on our YouTube page, Thomas Dahl's YouTube page, there's several about gut health, food, um, nutrition, food as medicine. So certainly a lot of resource there, but I think it's good to, most importantly, we wanted to touch high level on these five points, most importantly, make sure that people know how strongly behavior ties to digestion, that ties to our microbiome and the health of it. Um, I often will share with people that some dog trainers also, if a dog is dealing with certain behavior issues, they won't even approach the training protocols and techniques until the dog has a different diet and has been on that diet for a couple of weeks because they know that they can only get so far or really not far at all without the help of the internal balance. So that's just an interesting connection to draw for those that might not be aware. And like we said, you know, fresh food, even if you are feeding some dry kibble, adding that fresh food in, just think of dry kibble as 
cereal as Cheerios, um, you know, or kind of processed fast food, and you cannot thrive on that. So add on top of that Cheerio, um, all kinds of fresh fruits and veggies and acai and nuts and um, meats and some bone broths and, you know, all these wonderful things that you can feed them. And suddenly the Cheerios have transformed, right? And now it's fine that you're feeding the Cheerios. So it's right. kind of a, an easy way to think of it, just like topping off their cereal bowl. So, right. so yeah. food, food yeah. is food is extremely important. And also, you know, think about things like fermented foods, um, because we have in the microbiome, the bacteria that's there, they like to eat as well. You know, their, their, their role is to take all the nutrients that we have and to process that through and their, and their byproducts of their metabolism are the, the vitamins and the nutrients um, and the essential fatty acids that are going to be incorporated into our own biology, into our cells. Um, but, you know, to feed these guys, you know, are the things like the fermented foods and the prebiotics mm -hmm. are the things that actually help nourish that microbiome. Mm -hmm. So you not only want to flourish the diversity of the microbiome by a variety of fresh foods, um, you know, lots of things with fiber in it and, and meats and, um, you know, certain grains, and uh, to also feed them and, you know, things, fermented foods, uh, like, you know, fermented goat milk is a wonderful, wonderful way to mm -hmm. get some nutrients and prebiotics into a gut that doesn't have anything in it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I agree with you. Absolutely. You can't, you really, and, and a lot of people necessarily don't want to hear this because it, there, it, there's work involved. There's a learning curve and there is an education and an acceptance to, to know that, okay, I can't just, you know, dump a, a, a cup of kibble in a bowl and call it a day, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you can do that up until a certain point, mm -hmm. but things are gonna break down. And then honestly, the, 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 the question at the end of the day is, is it working? Yeah. You know, you know it maybe you, you're doing that. Maybe you're pouring in kibble and that's the only thing your dog has been eating for all of its life and it, everything seems fine. You know, he doesn't have a behavior issue. He doesn't have any GI stuff. He doesn't have any, any, you know, ailments that, that you know of. And, you know, maybe you're one of the lucky ones that somehow the dog was able to thrive on that. Um, but really it's not meant to thrive. It's just meant to, to create an ability to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so big difference, big difference there. And I just know that people in this community, people that are staying on to watch and learn about this, they're open They're They want the best for their animals. And so that's why we're here to help and give all those suggestions and resources. You can also meet individually, you know, one-to-one -one with either Barry or myself around food, and we can help you customize yeah. it specifically for your animal too. And what their unique needs are based on breed, or in my case, you know, dosha, their mind body type or whatever circumstances you have. If they have anxiety, there's ways to feed. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of resource and just let us know, reach out, don't hesitate if you need some more help with that. But we are going to move on to point number four, which is trainers and other resources and practitioners. Yeah. So, yeah. well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to let uh, Amanda kind of, you know, really touch upon all of those resources, but um, for, yeah. And for me, you know, a trainer, the importance of a trainer in situations where their behavior is really kind of, you need help. You know, there's a point in time where, you know, you just need help. You've done the things that you can on your own and it's time to reach out for other resources. And they, there are people that are, that are beautifully trained to, to do this and be there for you to work, you know, with you, with the dog, um, you know, to get a team uh, to, for, for success. And it's, uh, you know, it's okay. It's okay to reach out and get this help. And it, the, um, uh, the, sometimes the problem lies in is, is who you reach out to, you know, and is this person going to make things worse or it's going to make things better. And, you know, there are definitely trainers that are, they're not all the same, mm. you know, and there are these, the, the whole um, me mentality of, negative reinforcement type mm -hmm. of training has mm -hmm. really um, surfaced where we know that that's a completely counterproductive way of, of training any animal. All it does is create levels of new, new and different levels of fear. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want an animal that listens to you because they're afraid 
of you or afraid of consequences because that just sets up a whole other neurochemistry mechanism in their brain to um, to create a fear-based sort of you know mental wellness or mental state of being mm -hmm. and so positive reinforcements trainings is is really the way to go you know let, you know and just like it with anybody you do a good job yay you did a good job you're going to be more apt to do it again yeah you know yeah. and in some of these more um extensive cases of behavior issues that we're having with our dogs like say um extreme separation anxiety, which you know, some of our viewers might be dealing with right now, or aggressive or super reactive, or, you know, has had a bite in the house or something like that. Um, you really want to work with someone that is positive reinforcement training with behavior modification. There are specialties in dog training. Not all are the same as Dr. Sands said, and um, I'm going to put in a resource right now that was given to us by a wonderful trainer that we know, and we've had on many times and is a good friend, Christine, and um, she has, um, her company is, um, is on the tip of my tongue, uh, the Puppy Care Company. I will put her um, link in also, but this is a resource that she gave to us. She's based in San Diego, but this is a resource that you can find a positive reinforcement trainer who specializes in behavioral modification. Mm -hmm. And these individuals have obviously very specific knowledge of how to work with our dogs in a more advanced way. And that's really who we want to reach out to. And when we do reach out, make sure that they've dealt with dogs like yours, maybe multiple times. They've been training for many years, that this is not something new or different to them, but something that, you know, is an, is an old hat and they'll be able to just come in and really support you in your specific situation better. Right, right. And, and I'm assuming that a lot of these trainers are also, you know, going to be very invested in not only the dog, but the relationship that you have with the dog, mm -hmm. you know, how you show up as a person with the dog and then the environment that the dog lives in, because it's, it's, there's, it's multimodal mm -hmm. and you, and you don't, it, like I said, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a team. It's a working together from all these different levels, you know, and the, um, from, uh, from the, the environment that the animal lives in to the, the smells that are in the house, um, the, to the toxins that are in the house, to the um, emotions that are flying through the dynamics of the family, the relationship you have with the dog, you know, and, you know, in, now in, you're adding another person into the mix that's going to help but it's, you know, you know, I, I know of stories where the dog does really good with the trainer. They mm -hmm. go, yeah, for me, he does all this stuff. And then as soon as the trainer's gone and the dog is in the environment, all of that that just happened is oh, gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, what, what happened? Where did that go? Yeah. You know, you know, why is my dog so good with you and, and is unruly with me? Mm -hmm. you no, know, because there's an integration you know, and there's an allowance and there's a, it's a process. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, again, with the more advanced cases, we don't know what we need to know to help that dog. So that's why we must seek the people who do know and um, just be careful about, you know, who it is that you're bringing into that network because clearly their energy and their information is going to have a big influence. Um, so as I said, we put that link there for you to find behavior specialist um, type of trainers. And then Christine Young, who I mentioned, here's her link. Link, the puppy care company. She has also on a free guide right there on her main page that you can download and it's for enrichment. So when we were talking about, you know, giving our dogs the sniffari or things to do or like mental stimulation, in addition to good food, you know, it's just as important. And these, this um, download will help you get a lot of resources for that and ideas. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. And canine enrichment, you know, keep in mind, that every every breed is a little bit different to what they are intellectually driven to do, um, what they need, you know, what kind of stimulation, you know, there's a there's a whole you know plethora of information out there that talks about you know how much stimulation does my Chihuahua need as compared to my Belgian Malinois? <laughs> you know, it's it's very different, mm -hmm. and when you kind of consider the hardwiring sort of behavior of the individual breed um, and then sort of try to incorporate that into its life, you know, you'll find that there's less, there's less anxiety because anxiety 
um, is it's always a sideways energetic um, manifestation of something else that that we're not addressing. Mm. You know, whether they need to be ment mentally stimulated. Um, like for instance, if you have a, a one of the a hurting dog, you know, a type of a hurting breed, and it doesn't get to hurt anything, you know, it's just it's it's home and it's sitting around, you know, the cow, you know, the just not being able to go out and do its thing or not being able to herd, that energy that it has is going to get sideways manifested and say maybe um, it's gonna chew up the couch. And it's going to herd all the pieces together and create something that it needs, you know, to to focus on. Mm -hmm. So it's the physical energy of the dog that needs to be expended, expended, and it's also the mental energy of the dog mm -hmm. that needs to be expended. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be work; it could be, you know, play. We just yeah. have to, you know, creative and understand, you know, those different things and through these resources. And you know, I'm sure there's lots of fun ways that we can enrich them. Yes. Yeah. And better understand them. Something before we move on to our, our fifth point, I want to share uh, resources for animal communicators, because sometimes we just simply can't understand what's going on with the animal, or there's something that has happened that we're not even aware of, or, you know, their, their whole world is just as vibrant as ours. And so getting in there is sometimes challenging and animal communicators, good ones can help you with this. And so I've come across a few good ones on my way and I wanted to share their links with you. I'll do that now. So you have some additional resources, but you know, know that each of us can tune in on that subtle frequency and, and be able to have a conversation with our animals, you know, with, with intention, with clarity, with images, um, with feelings, and be able to better understand them. But if you need some additional tools, utilize one of these people, not to mention, it's really fun, actually, to work through the animal communicator. It's really interesting to hear, you know, your dog's perspective and what they like most. And, you know, all the all the funny things that kind of come yeah. out of the sessions. Yeah, I've had um, one, one of my clients came to mind, she went, um, to see a communicator and and when she came back to give me some feedback about what she you know what they talked about I was, she said I said what did your dog say you know what did she say and she says well she really likes she said she really likes coming here to see you which was me um because she gets to lay on this nice cool floor <laughs> as you make her feel better <laughs> Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's so sweet. But I, you know, I agree with you, Amanda. We all have the ability to communicate with our animals. And the way you do that is um, you know, just briefly is just getting out of your out of your head, sinking down into the heart in the heart space. Our communication between our animals is always heart to heart. It's that emotional frequency of love, compassion, care, kindness, appreciation. And when we get into that space and create the imagery around what it is that we, we may want to achieve, animals will, will, they will see the imagery. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can't, I can't tell you how they do that, but they respond to imagery. And even if it's um, perhaps, you know, to address that little, that little, the little dogs that are so anxious, uh, separation anxiety, you know, before you leave, take a minute, you know, or two to, to, to with your animal to go into your heart space to, um, you know, connect with them on that more kind of heart to heart level and allow them to know that it's OK, you're safe and imagine yourself, you know, show them the imagery of you getting up and leaving um, and, you know, perhaps going about your day, but also coming back into the house. Mm -hmm. And so that they know that there's, yes, there's a going, but there's also a coming mm -hmm. and it's all going to be, you know, fine. And so tune into that on an energetic level and just see, you know, like you said, if it's fun, it's fun to see, you know, what can happen. Mm -hmm. What comes through. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a question that we can discuss real quick is if a dog is anxious on walks, do you think it's better to give choice or should I be a confident leader? My pup is very hesitant sometimes and I allow him choice, but I keep hearing to be more assertive. Well, Susan, when I read that, and I, of course we want to hear from Barry too, that I just thought you can do both. You know, the idea is both like freedom, but also like guidance, you know, you want them to look to you to know that you've got their back so that they can then be safe to go sniff that bush because 
my pack is here with me, even if it's just the two of you. My pack is here. I am pre I'm protected, I'm safe, I'm connected, and I'm going to also have some freedom now. It's when there is that fear or uncertainty for most animals that they tend to act out. So that stability that you're providing them and your grounded leadership that allows for freedom is what they're looking for. So I would say it's a combination of both. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that, Amanda. You know, the the understanding when an animal comes into our lives is that we're already the alpha. You know, we're the one that's in charge. We're the one that feeds. We're the one that dictates the timing of things. And so they look to us for their experiences. Mm -hmm. And so we're already kind of a leader role. And it's important to, you know, to sort of be the, the um, you know, the kingly, queenly leader of this where you are the guidance and the support and the rock of you know behind the you know the foundation of the of the experience so that they know that it, it gives them the strength to be the confident you know dog that they can be knowing that you got their back mm -hmm. you know and, and that's just like in kids you know when there's these kids that are clinging to their moms and they're so afraid of the world um, they become very, some of them get, get, are very shy and timid and introverted and, and don't feel comfortable, you know, going out and experiencing. Um, however, if you just teach them the safe that, yeah, this is, you know, this is the environment. I got you. Ride your bike. I'm going to let go. Mm. I'm gonna let go, But you got this, you know, and if you fall, I will, I will be there to catch you. But so, yeah, definitely yeah. allow him to, to make his choice but be there to support him. Yeah. He knows you're a leader. He yeah. already knows you're a leader and he's looking to you for confidence. Yeah. It's great. And Rebecca, I read through yours. She was just sharing that she has a Jack Russell that's getting older. So she wants to give him some time off leash and, but he's now um, with his inability to hear is not, it's not working so well. So Rebecca, I would just say, just get a longer leash. It does. He needs to stay on a leash because it's going to be unsafe otherwise as he gets older, but just get a longer leash. And then he has a little more freedom and then a little more independence through that. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, I don't know how many places to have these little dog parks, but, you know, to go to a little dog park and, and just let them go, yeah. let them wander, sniff around and safe one that's safe and very spacious and open. Some dog parks can be very constricted and germy and dogs are out of control. So you do have to choose those very carefully, but some of them are much more open and spacious and finding one in your town is, is, you know, a, a game changer for something for many dogs. Really. Yeah, because, because, it, because it does allow them to kind of do what they want, whatever they want with whomever they want. And, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, certainly be mindful of who's showing up, you know, to the park and if there's bullies or big dogs or whatever. But, you know, the dynamics will work themselves out. Yeah. You know, they will. And the little old, yeah, I, I see the little old dogs just kind of like at the perimeter, <laughs> you know, just doing their thing, maybe sitting in a patch of sun mm -hmm. and everybody else is tussling or, and yeah. then there are those that are kind of on the outside watching it all. Like it's, it, it's magical, honestly, for me to see, you know, how they can just figure out their places and who's playing with who and, you know, and who's dog piling and who's, who's protecting and, yeah. <laughs> I find that there's a very little, it's the dog parks I go to, there's a little in, intervention of, there's little human intervention. Yeah. You know, somehow, you know, maybe there's one unruly one, mm -hmm. you know, that have to get, you know, yanked out of the pile, but, <laughs> but that's like the kid in the pool who goes around biting everybody, you know, <laughs> what happens? But no, there's no biting and you need to leave the pool. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see Benny? Look at him. He's resting. I said on the. <laughs> okay. Our last topic, our last uh, tip is tools and therapies. And there's certainly a lot to say under this because there are a, there's a plethora of, you know, everything from supplements and herbs to essential oils and flower essences to, um, you know, training techniques like thunder shirts for fearful dogs. And there's a ton to say. Again, we have talked about a lot of this and other conversations and other Samba Saturdays. So um, there's resources there, but what we really wanted to really just kind of touch on. And then the question I had for Dr. Sands was in some cases with some canines, especially 
when do medicines like pharmaceuticals come in? Like, how do you know when to even approach something like that? How do you get it? How do you know what's the theory and using pharmaceutical behavioral modification um, drugs for dogs? So, you know, talk to us about this very wide topic, Dr. Sands, but spending a little time in the pharmaceutical department. Yeah. Well, you know, like you said, there's a lot of things to do. There's a lot of tools in that tool in that toolbox. And it's certainly important to implement, you know, all of those things um, concurrently, you know, because everything has its own little pathway into the collective, you know, it's like that soup, that wellness soup, there's all these little ingredients, you know, that, that are implemented that, that have its own purpose. Um, and in, you know, pharmaceuticals, I feel uh, from a lot of people that I've, I listen to get a little bit of a bad rap, you know, because it's like an anti, like, I'm not going to put any drugs in my dog, or it's like, I'm only going to put drugs in my dog. So there's this, um, this duality or, or polarity around the use of these and, and really to demystify the benefit of pharmaceuticals is that pharmaceuticals were designed just like most Western conventional medicine to, to hit hard and fast. And the beauty of that is when you are in this kind of manic wound up state that you just can't get a handle on. Um, sometimes it's, 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 it's very beneficial to take that pill, that pharmaceutical, so that it, you know, within the allotted time it takes to take maybe, you know, 15, 20 minutes of, is the onset, um, you know, of most oral medications to allow the body just to relax and get out of that panic state so that now you can start implementing other other tools and therapies you know we we've used you know in 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 my setting in the er um there's a lot of sometimes there there are these animals that are just uh they're very anxious being in the in, in the environment that they're in you know and maybe some of them need to be hospitalized mm -hmm. you know like like i sometimes we have these dogs that say eat, eat a toxin they ate a bunch of grapes and we're worried that they may go into kidney failure. So they're hospitalized um, on treatments, but they don't feel sick because they're not sick yet. It's more preventative. You know, let's, let's prevent this horrible potential problem to happen if you've ingested like a ton of grapes or raisins. And they may just be super anxious just being in the cage um, mm -hmm. because they don't know why they're there. They feel fine. Um, and you know, we will give them a dose of, of a pharmaceutical, say, such as trazodone, um, and give them a, give them a dose of that. Um, and then you'll see them just kind of, you know, they, they just start to relax. And now they're chill. And now they're looking around. Um, and, you know, me being who I am in the ER, I'm sitting there spraying flower essences around and putting rose and lavender on their faces and doing all these other things, you know, and I'm walking over and doing some heart heart to heart communications to them, but they're still in this very animated environment of the hospital. And, it, it, you know, if we were in a dark room together with pretty music on, maybe that would be helpful. But when you're in the fight or flight mode and that high stress response, sometimes it, it's very beneficial and, uh, and, and necessary you know, to use those drugs. So, you know, I think in the cases of these of these these dogs that are just hyper aggressive or anxious, or you know, it's it's okay, you know, to give them a dose uh, and and let them get off of that wind up, that sort of psycho psychotic wind up mo moment, and then start implementing other things as their bodies are resetting. Because remember, I mean, trazodone is one of those serotonin reuptake inhibitors. That's what it's doing. It's allowing more serotonin in your brain to to be available for you, so that you can have those calming um, moments. Mm -hmm. And we know that we could do that through our gut brain, you know, mechanisms as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing you say that pharmaceuticals can be useful in acute situations and or when an animal is particularly heightened, reactive, fearful. 
what about medications that over time, you know, they're, they're going to be taken daily for some period? I know what we had spoken about before offline was for a short amount of time, that might be the, let's just call it band-aid that's needed, the support tool that's needed, but with the intention to slowly get them off of that, utilizing all of these other tools and all of these other ways in which we can help better understand them. Is, is, is that a good approach to take? Well, I don't think it's a necessarily wrong approach to take. Um, you know, we have to understand that I hear a lot of people um, saying, and they even say that this is what they, their vets told them, is that they need to be on these drugs constantly because it has this cumulative effect that um, is necessary to build up to the response. And, you know, for most pharmaceuticals, that's not um, 100% correct because these each of these individual drugs that you take into your body there's um, you know a pharmacokinetic that it goes through like how the pill interacts with your with your own biology and your own pharmacy where there's a um, you know you take it it gets absorbed into the bloodstream you have the effect and then you may have a peak effect at a certain point in time and then it starts metabolizing itself down so maybe a lot of these drugs are we're supposed to give them like every 12 hours. So by the time the 12 hours has passed, that drug has essentially been metabolized out of your system so that you need to take another pill, right? And so if there was this cumulative effect, you know, which was saying the more I take, the more I, my body builds it, well then a, a, a rational assumption around that would be, well, if I'm taking it all this time, I should be able to stop because it's already in my system, right? But that's not the case. And so I, I, I always really tell my clients on any pharmaceuticals, you know, unless we're dealing with say the use of an antibiotic as for an important infection to clear that, you really should take it for the course. Um, but, you know, the drugs like these um, anti-anxiety drugs or anti-inflammatories or pain, even pain relieving drugs, take them as needed, you know, when you're, and, and, and don't give them the dose, you know, say you're on trazodone for a couple of days and you're implementing, you know, these other therapies, uh, you know, don't give them the dose one time and see what happens. See what shifts that you're seeing. You know, I, I find a lot of people get caught up in this false sense of security with these pharmaceuticals, thinking that, um, you know, their dogs can't live without it. But yet they've never tried to take them off the drug to see what's the effect. But also that being said, if you're on these drugs for long term, understand that the body being as intelligent as it is, has the have these negative feedback mechanisms um, that if you abruptly stop some drugs, the body will, will, will know that mm -hmm. because there, there becomes a reliance upon that mechanism, you know, because the body doesn't, doesn't do it anymore. We see that with, um, drugs like prednisone, mm -hmm. um, and prednisone can, some dro do, do, drugs can make dogs crazy, you know, and prednisone is one of them. They can have psychotic effects just from that. Wow. And, um, if you're giving a lot of steroids into the system, then the body will stop making its own steroids because mm -hmm. why should it, you know, it, it's smart. If it's already taking it, it doesn't need to make it. Mm -hmm. And so you, you theoretically and, and, and honestly shouldn't stop cold Turkey prednisone if you're on it for a long time, because mm -hmm. you're going to go into a crisis where your body doesn't have enough of the of that cortisone, you know, to, to show up. Mm -hmm. so there's, there's weaning processes. So if you're on, say, these pharmaceuticals for a long term, okay. um, I would say, you know, to, there's a, you should, we should wean off of the drugs, you know, slowly. And you can get that through the help of, you know, of an integrated veterinarian it should be more than happy to help you figure out a way to just gradually transition off of medications. 
Yeah, I think that that's a great place to end. Actually, Dr. Sands is just bringing attention yet again. I feel like our audience is very aware of this because we say it a lot, but a holistic vet slash integrative vet is so very different than a conventional vet. And um, hopefully that divide, that distance comes closer and closer as time goes on and as more of the importance and the impact of natural healing comes out for animals specifically. But in the meantime, your conventional vet is going to give you very different guidance than your integrative will. So even if it's just for this situation and when your dog needs its nails clipped or something, you know, you're going to your local vet, but in these more advanced, more system-wide, more impactful when you start bringing in pharmaceuticals, make sure that you do have a vet, even if you have to drive an hour and a half and have that session or, you know, good thing now, a lot of it's available online, but having that resource is key to the success of and the health of our animals. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's a, a, an amazing, the most important resource we can leave you with really. Yeah. And I have, I have my, on my website, you know, if you are interested in a consultation, um, a telemedicine consultation, we can certainly arrange that. You just, you know, click on the, the link for a consultation. Yeah. You know, we can do that. Yeah. And it, and many on many different levels, you know, it could be a full one, a little one, you know, yeah. whatever, whatever you need. I just, I feel like in this day and age, resources um, are important and people, I just find that um, people just are, are, they want solutions and they're ready for changes, you know, and they just need to know how to do that and who can I trust and who can I talk to, yeah. you know, and build up my team because, you know, it, we all just, we all want to feel good, I think. And we want our dogs to feel good and we don't want to be anxious about our dogs being anxious. <laughs> you know, that's just this, this cycle that we're going through. And so really it starts, it's, it's a group effort. Um, of the of the person, the environment, the food, you know, all these other things, nature, embracing that, you know, and kind of, you know, encompassing all of that to understand that it, there's no linear relationship, especially when it comes to behavior, mm -hmm. really multimodal and, and just to, you know, embrace that. As you said, you know, your clients are very invested, you know, in doing those things, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes the last straw around all of this is looking at yourself mm -hmm. and going in because I have met many clients who are already implementing a lot of this, you know, the dietary changes and the supplements and the, um, and the aromatherapies and, and the, um, the herbs and whatever it is. And yet it's still not working, mm -hmm. you know? And so then that last piece of the puzzle sometimes is yourself mm -hmm. and, and how you're feeling and what energies you're putting out into that, relationship yeah. and um you know i also i also work with people you know to help with that as well you know to get into coherence and you know heart brain connections and emanate that out and, and that's also part of my study um that i'm going to be hoping to implement so whoever's watching this um mm -hmm. you know and even if you know people that haven't watched this yet or your your doggy friends or any any animal lovers out there um, I would so appreciate it if they were able to go on my website and take that survey. You know, you do get a, a free download of the optimum, 10 optimum ways for, for pet health um, and, and, and human wellness as well. Mm -hmm. And I think I have some resources as well of what we talked about on the website about um, um, stress and de-stressing, mm -hmm. you know, just really understanding those mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Sands. I know this is a huge topic. You know, it's an enormous part of our lives and our animals' lives. And yet just having conversation again, getting to kind of understand where we're going and what's possible, I hope is very helpful for our audience. Um, uh, Ella says here, Nice. Uh, you're one energy. I work also with the owner and behavior and energy. Very nice. So important. Yeah. Ella is in uh, the Netherlands working yeah. <laughs> in this way. Thank you, so. Yeah. Thank you, Ella. Thank you for what you do. 
Yes, yes. And thank you, Dr. Sands. As we shared, there's so many resources on her site. There it is right there, drberrysands.com. You can find everything that you're looking for. And many uh, resources on samadog.com, of course. Meditation with our pets is something that, as speaking of the animals and the humans together, is something very helpful. So I have lots and lots of options uh, for guided meditation. So, you know, don't hesitate to let us know everyone that's listening to this, like we are here for you as your resources. So if you have questions, don't hesitate, reach out. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you again, Dr. Sands. And You're welcome. And we will talk with you all soon. See you next on a Saturday. Thank you. Bye for now, everyone. <laughs>